Now, it will come as no surprise to you that quite often you are getting ripped off by your local council. They're spending millions, billions of pounds uh, on your behalf doing things that you never asked them to do. Don't forget, most of the money you pay them in council tax goes uh, on their salaries and goes on their pensions. Now we find out that drivers are being fleeced to the tune of £50 a second, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Let's talk to Duncan Simpson, Research Director at the Taxpayers Alliance, and find out why these councils think they can get away with it. Duncan, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mike. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I mean, I've been noticing, I'll tell you what, in Sussex recently, um, in in various different, because they've got small kind of councils around different parts of Sussex, but they've started putting in these, um, what can only be described as solar-powered parking ticket machines, right? So you park in a place where it used to be free, you now have to find your way to this machine, which has got a sort of solar panel on the top of it, uh, and it's powered by the sun, obviously. Um, and you have to buy a ticket to park in a place that you didn't used to have to buy a ticket for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I imagine it's pretty pretty maddening. I've been, I've been going through the numbers, and um, you look at, I think it's the top 10 councils across England for mm. the uh, penalty charge notice. All of them are in London. Yeah. So Lambeth, Ealing, Islington, Haringey, uh, Hammersmith, Fulham, those sort of the top five. They've got sort of a massive income. I think between those 10 councils, they got uh, over £300 million of revenue in penalty charge notice and other associated fees. Now, bear in mind, these are the very same councils which have spent months and months and millions of pounds redesigning roads to make them safer for cyclists. Many of these councils are now getting rid of these cycle lanes. So not only are they infuriating a lot of motorists with already very, very high parking charges, they're um, make, making the situation frankly far worse by driving through the middle of of London in particular um, by introducing these, uh, these these schemes. Now, it's perfectly reasonable if there are more people doing cycling and not using public transport, particularly at the moment, but a lot of these councils seem to have done it um, on the hoof of the, hoof of the moment without really much thought to who's actually paying for it. Yeah, exactly right. And so I presume these people, some genius has worked out that this is a great way to raise a load of revenue for which they previously didn't have. Yeah, indeed. And, and uh, you know, obviously this, this is only in relation to English English authorities, as you said, it's about one point eight billion pounds. Um, I'd imagine if you did it for UK wide, it'd be comfortably in excess of two billion. The problem with a lot of these schemes is that you know, even though it's it's quite reasonable to make sure that um, a, a charge is levied on someone who is parking somewhere where they shouldn't be parking illegally, um, the concern is that a lot of councils will be doing this effectively as a way to to, to raise revenue to conduct the ordinary course of business. Now, now, councils have been able to do this for about thirty years. I think it was an act of parliament which which John Major passed. Yeah. Um, so councils keep the revenue rather than the police um, if they spend it generally on on transport related projects. It, there are some exemptions to so some councils, for example, if they're you know good performers, they can basically spend it on whatever they want to. But generally speaking, councils should be spending it on highways maintenance, road maintenance, yeah. like. Where that doesn't happen, though, that's very concerning because obviously motorists, motorists expect a certain degree of service that are paying these uh, pretty pretty large fees, but if councils aren't doing that, then that's, that's obviously very well. But, I mean, are they governed by the local government association? I mean, is that who kind of polices them? Because if so, uh, I don't imagine that's particularly robust in terms of a regulator. <laughs> no, no, the, L- the LGA is just the trade body, really. I oh, mean, okay. they're, they're a very a very angry trade body, um, but they, they just sort of, you know, basically take us to task whenever we talk about uh, local government spending, they don't like us imagine but uh, no they're just just effectively a trade body. but a lot of this a lot of these powers are vested in local authorities by by westminster years and years ago and you know obviously i'm sure that the council will turn around and say we're just fulfilling our statutory duty nothing to worry about here the counterpoint of course is that you've got councils up and down the country who are you know doing some pretty terrible spending and you will see this ratchet up in the months ahead whereby local authorities understandably can put under a lot of pressure not least in social care for example in recent months on the other hand why is it the case that a lot of councillors feel the need to fly business class to japan for a business mm. trip why is it they need to fly, feel the need to fly to Nice? You know, to see this year after year after year, hundreds of councillors and local authority bureaucrats fly to, fly to a real estate uh, or property conference on the south coast. Yes. Because, you know, they have to get that knowledge every year, right? Um, so, we, you know, we see this, this kind of egregious success time after time. So it's when these councils um, put, out the, put out the begging bowl and say that these fees for parking are totally legitimate, but on the other hand, are, are, are clearly not using um, our cash particularly well. That's, mm. that's pretty nauseating when we see that. Well, it really is. And presumably, and I don't know, again, who's going to be asking this question, they must be saving some money. I mean, we've just been doing a piece about how um, the uh, supposed average family has saved something like 7,000 quid by not uh, having to go into work during lockdown and not going into an office. I mean, most council workers are not going into offices either. So presumably there must be some money being saved. Are we going to see the benefits of that? 
Uh, well, I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, I, I know, I, I know, I know for a fact there's a lot of councils, particularly in um, particularly London and South East, who are still who are still maintaining some homework and very limited uh, going stuff at the moment. So obviously, there's you know some limitation on the on the running costs for a lot of uh, councils, uh, councils, estates, there, you know, Camper Hall and Shire Hall and so forth. Um, so you know, one could hope that might be the case, um, but I, I, I wouldn't hold my breath. I mean, you know, we see this in central government as well. I think that business spent something like seven hundred thousand pounds on keeping the building during the summer months yeah. the year before last. So, um, you know, the kind of cock-up that you see in central government absolutely happens in local authority. Oh, of course. And my worry is, that, as, as, as I've, I've sort of uh, intimated, I suppose, you know, there isn't really any great um, auditing of what it is that they do. I mean, yes, there is obviously auditing done of their books and obviously there's an annual report that they put out, but mm-hmm. there's an awful lot of money going in and out and swilling around inside these huge organisations. I remember when I was working in Edinburgh, the head of Edinburgh City Council was paid some ludicrous amount of money, like £550,000 a year, uh, on the grounds that, oh, it's a very big budget, uh, it's like running mm-hmm. British Petroleum. And you go, well, yeah. it's not actually like running British Petroleum, yeah. is it? I mean, it's a city council. It's a local council. Yeah. You should not be getting paid more than the prime minister, but by a factor of five. Yeah, and I, I, we, we come across that argument a lot, actually. Obviously, we have our town hall rich list, which we do every year, and numerous bits of local authority spending that we go into. I just, I just find that maddening. I mean, obviously, you know, you have a large budget because people are compelled to pay tax. It's not the same as people giving their money to a company voluntarily to right. buy a product. You know, added to which... If, if they can point to me, if the LGA can you know, turn up and show me exactly how many former council chief executives are now running FTSE 100 companies, <laughs> might have some credence. But obviously, well, they don't, I, do I, they? That's the I, thing. I'm going to take a guess and say no one who used to run a council now runs a FTSE 100 firm. So no. it's completely. You know, fallacious argument to put that out there, but we see it time and time again. It's absolutely bogus, yeah. But also, they employ loads of people. That's the other reason they've got such a big budget because they literally employ more and more people, no matter what the uh, economy is, is is like, no matter how bad the economy is. There's always more and more council workers being hired. I mean, I used to do a, a slot on the radio uh, just with council jobs that were going that particular week. I mean, there was loads of them. Oh, oh, totally. And, and um, obviously, there was you know sort of a drop off and a sort of slight idea about three or four years ago, whereby you know the number of public sector workers I think has uh, declined somewhat. I think across central government, local government, devolved uh, devolved parts of uh, governing the UK, we're now seeing a, a, an uplift in um, the number of people in, in public sector employment. So um, yes, we don't know at this stage what kind of changes there have been in staffing in local authorities. That will become much clearer when they start publishing their accounts for the current financial year um, you know, towards the end of next year. Um, so we won't be able to get a, a clear steer, but um, but almost almost certainly there hasn't been a particular drop off. I mean, one thing that um, I think would merit further investigation would be to establish, you know, how many local authority workers, if any, have actually gone furlough. So, you know, not merely having you know the, the, the usual sort of guaranteed wage, but then also having it um, effectively sort of doubled up through uh, through the furlough scheme. So I wouldn't put it past local authority. Yeah, no, absolutely. As well, to actually to actually do that. No, I mean, I had a similar situation with Southwark Council not that long ago, right at the start of the pandemic. Actually, I got a ticket, uh, a fine for going up the one, a one-way street the wrong way, um, which right. I did, and it was entirely my fault. However, I didn't, what I didn't know was it was a one-way street because there was no sign that said it was a one-way street, and the, on, the only no-entry sign was about 25 feet in the air. So as I was driving, you know, I didn't actually see it because it was, you know, I would have had to be able to see through my roof to see it. Um, yeah. So I appealed the, the fine, which was, I think, something like 125 quid, uh, reduced to 68 if you paid it, you know, within two weeks. Um, and so they, they, they put it on hold. Um, and then they told me that I couldn't appeal it uh, because the car wasn't mine. Uh, and I'd have to then get the uh, permission from the owner, which I then got. Uh, they then said, um, oh, uh, as, I, as I sent the second one in, they said, oh, this has already been settled. And I said, well, has it already been settled? You told me I couldn't <laughs> apply for the appeal because I was, it was a leased car. And they said, well, apparently it's been uh, it's already been decided and uh, the appeal's been denied. <laughs> I was like, right, OK, well, what do I do now? So I eventually rang them. And it was such a laborious process that I got halfway through the conversation with this guy. And I said, do you know what? This is what you people do. You make it so difficult to appeal and so complicated and time consuming that people just in the end, I just, I'm just going to pay you the 68 quid because it's easier than going. Because I said, what will I have to do? He said, yeah. well, you can write another letter. I'm like, but I've already written a letter. You know, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah. Co- computer says no, right? Yeah, um, that's it. It's, and, it's, it's, it's one of those. I think the... Um, uh, uh, yeah, as, as I was saying earlier, a lot, a lot of these traffic management schemes of, you know, no entry for cars, bikes early and so forth, um, a lot of people are going to be caught out by this. Right. Uh, not through, you know, as, as I'm sure what you know, happened to you, not through any kind of, you know, malicious disregard of 
uh, choosing not to read the road or anything, but um, a, a lot of people are going to be suffering with this, you know, um, as, as we you know, put it in the wider context of already are going to be you know, charted with very, very high fees for this. Um, fuel duty has been ratcheting up year after year, obviously vehicle excise duty. Um, you know, there's numerous other burdens on motorists across the country. Um, and what local authorities have done in the last six months may well be justified for people who are choosing not to use the car anymore and choosing to cycle. And, you know, I, I'm almost certain many people in Hackney and Islington overwhelmingly don't have a car, and so we appreciate that. Mm. Um, but that's not the case. That's not the case for everyone who pays in council tax and chooses to drive a car as well. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on uh, exactly how uh, badly motorists are faring with a lot of, lot of, lot of local authorities' decisions. Well, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, they must have to employ, you know, loads and loads of people to answer all of these queries and all of them, you know, like the guy that I spoke to. Actually, um, I wasn't on hold that long. I was quite surprised. I was only on hold about 10 minutes and he actually came on the phone. But you can imagine the banks of people having to deal with these kinds of queries and these kinds of, uh, you know, fines. Oh, yeah, huge. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's effectively an industry. And, um, you know, bear in mind that the, the, the data which was published, the 1.8 billion, that doesn't um, wholly incorporate sort of private sector companies who also do this. So this is generally only government. Uh, so this is generally only revenue which is going uh, directly to local authorities. So there is sort of another side of things whereby um, private companies who've been contracted out by local authorities to do this, they will also be getting revenue. So I'd imagine that the total is is much higher. As I said, this doesn't incorporate Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. So um, you know, it is it is literally a multi-billion pound industry yeah. um, to levy to levy these fees. So uh, yes, I imagine the workforce is pretty. Uh, pretty large up and down the country. Well, it is. So it's, it's, it's basically a sort of a, it's a pyramid scheme, isn't it? So you set up a parking <laughs> charge, you hire a load of people to administer it, uh, and you reap the benefits. Yeah, indeed. No, it could be a new new, new, new career to go into. Because <laughs> I remember there used to be, did there not used to be um, private a lot of private parking companies as well that would get a huge contract from the local council to kind of administer the car parks, if you like? Yes, yeah, indeed, and that, uh, that's that is still the case. That is still the case. They're um, they they are so there. Obviously, there's you know, the distinction between on and off street parking. Um, generally, the more visible stuff um, of traffic will be the on street on street parking work. But right. private companies are still are still used to do this. So there is a sort of a slight disaggregation on on where the revenue goes. But ultimately, it's the it's the council which chooses to enforce it. Yes, so. the other racket that they used to do a lot of in uh, in certain cities, certainly in Edinburgh, they did it, and I think they've done it in in some other cities like Leeds and. Uh, and Manchester as well, where you, you you give out residential parking permits, but you ate, you sell more of them than there are spaces. So basically, by buying a residential yeah. parking permit for your street, it doesn't actually give you the right to park there. Yeah, in, in, indeed. I mean, I, I would imagine that's a combination of um, you know councils being slightly malicious as well as cock up. Um, you know, cock up is, a, is, a, is an important part of this stuff as well. So, um, uh, yes, certainly. I mean, particularly in cities. I mean, less so in sort of small local authorities, particularly rural that as much but um but but definitely down with the capital that's um, that's a pretty pretty common affliction i imagine yeah absolutely right well let's see what we can do uh, to get some stories in on it duncan thanks very much indeed duncan simpson there from the taxpayers alliance